Welcome to Women in the Arena podcast, the podcast celebrating women doing extraordinary things in plain sight. I'm your host, Audra Egan, and our mission is to elevate the value, strength, and resilience each woman brings to the world. Without further delay, let's go ahead and start the show. Welcome in, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me again this week. This week's guest is a documented champion of women. My my guest this week is Sarah Gristwood, and she is this amazing, remarkable author that is committed to publicizing women's experiences throughout history. As a young journalist, she championed women's voices through news outlets such as the Guardian's Women's Page and is a founding member of the Women in Journalism and the Women's Equality Party. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, absolutely the Women's Equality Party. As a historian, she has consistently explored the question of women and power throughout the ages. She now regularly broadcasts with Sky News, CNN, and the BBC specifically on royal and historical topics. She is also a graduate of Oxford University and a fellow for the Royal Historical Society and of the RSA. You're going to have to explain to me and all us Americans what the RSA is. Uh, I want to know more about that. The letters stand for Royal Society of the Arts, but it, it's it's longer than that. It's the arts and industry, and it's about the interaction of the two and just don't go there, basically. It's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, she, so, sorry about, she, she's a graduate of Oxford University, and she has been shortlisted for both the, Mar- the Marsh Biographical Award and the Ben Pimlot Prize for political writing. Oh, my goodness. She has a recent book, and that's what we're going to talk about today, Secret Voices, A Year of Women's Diaries. I cannot wait for you to meet her, and I cannot wait to get into this conversation. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you, Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much for being here, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I I am so fascinated about the work you do. First of all, the work that you do not only is important, but it is also only too often unsung, meaning that doing the work of documenting history and doing it accurately Mm. is often overlooked and not nearly as appreciated. What drew you into this particular area of documenting women's voices, which is very, very important because it'll help us shape our future. Mm. So how did you Mm. start? How did you start with that? It's always been natural to me, I guess. When I first started writing as a journalist, it was still, there was nothing like the amount of work done in the field that there is today. It was still opening up into slightly new territory. All these years on, I can't believe that no one has gone back in a popular public way um, to revisit the question of anthologizing women's diaries, because certainly in this country, the anthologies out there, which were written at the end, edited, put together at the end of the 20th century, not the 21st, uh, the proportion of women to men is nothing remotely like equal. And this despite the fact that there's so many amazing women diarists out there that in many ways diary writing was regarded as a female form. So let's talk a little bit about this art of diary Mm. writing and what a delicate and special relationship it is basically with yourself. Mm. But for those that, that aren't familiar with the practice, what can you explain us a little bit more of what this diary writing and these diary entries are? Mm. Well, of course, the word diary, like journal, comes from day. So ideally, it is a daily record in which you can put anything you like. So 
in some cases, it is as basic as went to the shops, watch television in the evening, though I have to say, for obvious reasons, I haven't quoted too many of those. Or it can be absolute, you know, your your way into a whole discussion of life, your identity, your political views. Now, some, some women do keep it up uh, very religiously, but do keep it quite short. And of course, those entries are the gain gain a kind of magic mystique when with time passing. So I'm fascinated to read from the 18th century. Had my hair powdered and frizzed today. That operation over. Went into the orchard to pick apples and gave them to the maid for, to make jelly. Whereas I probably wouldn't be fascinated by a modern went to the hairdresser and the cinema, you know? Uh, but, uh, absolutely. But, and of course, some of these women are recording very extraordinary events in their days. I mean, you have only to think of Lady Bird Johnson, the wife of President Johnson, of course, Lyndon B. Johnson. Um describing driving down into Dallas one November day in 1963 in the car behind President Kennedy. And how she thought at first that the sound of bangs was firecrackers coming from the crowd. But others, like, say, Virginia Woolf, do use their, or did use their diaries well, partly and quite consciously to explore their writing craft, but also to analyse, to kind of work out their ideas, to work out where their emotions were coming from. So one day she writes about coming back from her sisters at Charleston, Vanessa's, and how it's made her dissatisfied with her own life. And that is that partly because Vanessa has children and she doesn't. What is it? And she works that through on the page. As for, you know, who and how they write, of course, some diarists from, oh, Fanny Burney, again, 18th century, to Anne Frank, have, have addressed their diary to, for example, an imaginary friend. And Frank addressed hers to Kitty, and Fanny Burney addressed hers to a certain Miss Nobody, she wrote, because to whom could she speak freely? To nobody. What uh, remarkable is what is going through my mind. Remarkable. Mm. How did you get access to these very intimate? Mm documented mm -hmm. thoughts of these women because that's what these are these are documented intimate uh, emotions thoughts mm -hmm. actions that they probably couldn't tell anybody but yeah. whomever they were speaking well, to in their diary yes that's right uh, well a lot of these diaries have since become out there are published or you know are known from from um, well-respected libraries. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because I do think that these are secret voices in the sense that the women were using their diaries to voice sentiments that were transgressive in their own day. But maybe we accept them a bit more readily. And I do believe that while in some ways, you know, we, while at the time women needed the privacy, the secrecy of the diary form, so they could say what they really felt. It's not entirely an inward-looking business, I suspect. I wonder if there isn't sometimes almost a sense of a hand reaching out across the void. I mean, these women couldn't voice their anger, their ambition in their own day, but maybe they wished they could. That that you saying that just gives me chills because I'm thinking of historically mm. of these women that you are reading about, some in certain days and times, 
if they had expressed how they really felt yeah. and said it loudly and publicly, their husbands mm. could commit them as quote unquote mad mm. and put them in an asylum mm. simply for speaking out and expressing their feelings that are, mm. and emotions that may be in opposition to how their mm. husband feels mm. or how society mm-hmm. has viewed them on what is proper and what is not for a, yeah. a, a young lady. I just, y- them having the only outlet to mm-hmm. use, to utilize their voice uh, is in paper and a pen. Mm-hmm. It just is overwhelming. And it also actually chokes me a little bit because not having the ability to speak mm-hmm. about who you are and how you feel sounds like, quite frankly, like a hell on earth. Well, as Florence Nightingale wrote in her diary, in the years before she was discovered, was allowed to pursue her vocation as a nurse, uh, she wrote, my present life is suicide. I lie down each night in hoping I won't have to get out of the bed again. But that was, she was someone massively famous now, of course, as you know, one of the pioneers of of nursing. Uh, But like Beatrix Potter, famous for her little tales, for Peter Rabbit and the rest, of course. But both of them were Victorian young ladies who had to live this long pupillage, this long almost confinement as a Victorian young lady at home. And they were in their thirties before they actually managed to win free of their families to follow their path. In their thirties. And in Victorian age, these, the, the longevity mm. of human race in general wasn't nearly as long as it is now. No, so thirties yeah. could be considered at that time middle-aged. Yes, well, I think that's probably what helped them, in fact. They clearly weren't going to do what their families would have preferred and make an, a highly eligible marriage. So therefore, perhaps they, they did have a bit, a bit more freedom coming their way. But quite often, I found, even in the privacy of their diaries, uh, women didn't always speak their anger directly. It quite often, in fact, after all, Florence Nightingale's entry, we're talking about despair. Uh, Beatrix Potter cloaks it in a bit of wry humour. Before, before she began publishing The Little Tales, she did some very impressive drawings of fungi. I think they're now in a, there's a new exhibition opening, isn't there, in New York, I think. In the- I believe you're correct. And now these are treated very seriously indeed. But at the time when she went to say she was given an introduction by her uncle to the director of the Great Botanic Gardens at Kew, but the director was having none of it. And Beatrix, she wrote in her diary, it's very upsetting for a shy person to be treated as conceited, especially when the shy person happens to be right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, there's a couple of things as you were speaking that yeah. came to mind. And the first is even in their own diaries, these women felt like they had to muffle yes. themselves. Yes. I think and, which possibly they didn't, I, I would suspect psychologically that they didn't often a lot of them didn't voice it as anger even to themselves they thought of themselves as you know more or less unhappy but they didn't feel they they didn't feel they had the right to be angry even in their own heads we can be wow. angry on their behalf now perhaps I will be angry for Florence Nightingale and Beatrix Potter. I will be angry for them because they are the shoulders that we stand upon. Everything that we do is because someone else made it possible. And there are these fearless women Mm. that have um, nameless faces 
nameless voices yeah. that we don't realize mm. we have to thank mm. for our position and our ability today. Absolutely. Mm. And that that is just like I said, it's completely overwhelming to think that these women that we know and that we admire and are historical figures and were trailblazers in their own right yes. felt the very same things that yeah. you and I have felt throughout our lifetime. Yes. So that is, that is both comforting and absolute, absolutely infuriating at the same time that these emotions are still the same because the situations are still prevalent in, in, uh, you know, with some nuance, but we're still dealing with the same stuff Mm. Mm. that has been dealt with for centuries. And not even, I totally agree. And not even just the, the despairing young woman. One thing that really struck me was the way there are some dilemmas we think of as modern, that women were voicing centuries ago, 200 years ago and more. Elizabeth Fry, uh, English, so I don't know how well she's known there, but a great prison reformer, really an important figure, a Quaker. And she wrote about her concern that her husband and I think it was 11 children were distracting her from her career. Her, her vocation, and how they didn't like. They got jealous when she spent, spent too much time on this prison reform work that was her, her life's work, her mission. But juggling work and family? Well, that one hasn't exactly gone away, has it? No. But we didn't, it's- but I didn't expect to find it back in the early 19th century. I wouldn't have expected that either, mm. and that there was these progressive women, mm. and I should say, I think most women were probably progressive, that mm. just not all of them felt empowered mm. to act yeah. on that. Yeah. But there are these women that we look at and admire as these historical figures, and then you give us access to their innermost thoughts, and they're the same. Mm. I know. Yes, I agree. That's the magic. That's the that's the real clarion call for me too. Well, the other thing that that I'm hearing is these women that mm. and, and during those time it was considered considered middle age. I know 30s sounds like we're babies now because <laughs> believe me, in my 30s I'm yeah, yeah. I, I I was practically a teenager in my 30s, Quite. Um, but. Uh, looking at it and they were in their 30s. So they were in the middle of their lifetime mm. where many of us, many of the audience is, uh, that listens to me are in the middle of their lifetime. Mm. They're somewhere between mm. their mid 40s and their mid 50s. Mm. So we are considered middle age. Mm-hmm. Why I'm bringing this up is because a lot of these women mm. finally in their middle age probably got fed up with whatever they were dealing mm. with and couldn't, couldn't live with the fact of doing nothing or living status quo up to that point. So they went, you know what, forget it. I'm either going to go for it and go down swinging or this mediocrity is going to kill me. So the, my point of all of this is if these women and centuries ago could get fed up in their mid, in their midlife crisis, quote unquote, and do something miraculous that we all study now historically, Mm. then we certainly here in our middle age, can do anything we want and still be empowered to change the world. Mm -hmm. And do you know, one of the things that struck me about the extracts, following on from what what you're saying, is that we've always thought of women in the past as hating to get older, as it's only now that that, that we can say that, you know, 50 is the new 40 and whatever. But Women in the past were very often much more accepting of the different stages of and enjoying the different stages of life. 
than than than, than we expect them to be. I think you you read of them writing about you know how actually it's really rather nice not to have to bother um, about getting dressed up if you don't want to any longer, and about one of early 20th century or mid 20th century novelist writer Dawn Powell about never be sorry for a part for a party of elderly ladies out together no men around they're having the time of their lives <laughs> and, <laughs> and um may sarton the, the, the new england great new england writer about how uh, how she was sitting round a table with, well, she herself, I think, was in her 60s or 70s, you know, someone in their 40s, someone in their 20s. And they were all just enjoy. they were at different stages, but they'd all, except perhaps for the one in her 20s, decided that they weren't going to live looking for and waiting for the dream of male protection, that they were happy in their skins, basically. So they were learning to be really comfortable in their own skin, mm. even then. I, I thought that yeah. being uncomfortable in your own skin was this modern invention because of all of this societal pressure. Mm. But you're saying that they've been, that that's probably been prevalent mm. for a while but there are these women that have women, decided yes. that they were going to yes. be comfortable with who they are. Yes, exactly that. Yeah. And the other yeah, thing is that, forgive me, that women in the past, I found some of them, wrote far more freely about their bodies than I quite realized. Really? That they were more accepting about their about their bodies, their yes, their yes, for example, their their figure, yeah. whatever. Well, again, you've got Hester Thrale, Doctor Johnson's friend, so end of the eighteenth century, writing in these words about the change of life, writing about how she put it, her oldest friend was leaving her. She meant her monthly cycle, her period. And she she wrote about how, when she put it, the first change of life came, Menash, the start of puberty, uh, a particular mark appeared on her on her face, like a, almost like a measles mark, and now it had come again. But other than that, she didn't really feel any different. But uh, you know, again, I hadn't quite expected to find women from that far in the past uh, writing about menopause, about menage. You know, we tend to think that at least frankness about it is a modern invention. Well, guess what? Our grandmothers, our foremothers can teach us a few things there as well. They're very wise. They were, they were, it seems that, that there was a lot of boldness mm. as well. Yes. But in the privacy of their own thoughts. Yes. Because that might have been the only place that they could be bold. Or their own, yes, their own pen. Yes. You certainly wouldn't have got newspaper articles about the menopause when, when Hester Thrale was writing about it. Oh my gosh, no. Are you kidding? We just now start <laughs> to be comfortable exactly. and openly. Mm. speak of it um and i've only now quite frankly gotten comfortable with saying yeah i'm in the middle of menopause that's mm. not something i can help mm. my body's doing it mm. for me yes and one of my least favorite least favorite uh symptoms of menopause is brain fog oh and tell me about rather that. than rather than try and cover it up mm. I tell, I actually tell my coworkers, I'm having a really bad brain fog day. Mm -hmm. Don't blame it on me. I'm not an idiot. I'm just in the middle of menopause. You're sure. just going to have to forgive yeah. me. I'm not ashamed of it mm -hmm. anymore because mm -hmm. I can't, I, I can't control it. I, sometimes it comes out and I can't hide it. I can't minimize it. It just is. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing that these women were also bold and mm -hmm. beautiful and accepting mm -hmm the changing the changes of their bodies and not feeling ashamed yes yes i agree 
Yeah, totally. Virginia Woolf wrote about it as well. She said, you know, well, what do I think lies ahead? Well, for a start, there will be the change of life. Do I fear it? Because, of course, she had a history of mental difficulty. Um, she said, well, you know, but on the one, the other hand, it's natural. It comes to all women. If need be, I'll lie out in the sun and read. She or even she, with her long history of mental difficulties, and we don't know if whether to any degree they were hormonal, even she, in her diary, could contemplate it frankly and without without fear. I want you to consider this because it's uh, something that's been running running through my mind as you've been speaking. These these women's innermost thoughts, these words, they're so similar to what we have that we have right now today on our own. Mm. If we had been given access to their words prior to you documenting this and making it openly available to all of us, if we had greater understanding, do you think that we would be further along because we would have... Mm historical references you to look to to guide us you yes you can't your 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 our listeners can't see it because i'm nodding i've been nodding as you're speaking but yes i do one of the things i took away from this book from doing this book unexpectedly and one i hope that people who read it might do is a sense of support. Those of us who grew particularly, perhaps who grew up in the latter part of the 20, in 20th century, um, often felt like frontline troops. But guess what? There is this army of warrior women at our backs. And if I may, a very personal note, um, I think I sent the proofs of this book finally off for printing last summer on the day before my husband's funeral. So I was edit I was putting it together as his health was failing. Um and obviously some of the women in this book have also been widowed. And as someone who doesn't necessarily, this is me, someone who doesn't necessarily find it easy to trust the validity of, of, of their own feelings, hearing the voices of other women saying, oh, the unexpected anger that comes afterwards, you have to hate somebody because they're alive and your husband is dead. One of them um, wrote... I think it was Frances Partridge, uh, about knotting herself into life still with huge loops, almost like huge crochet loops of thread. She felt that she needed something to tie her down to life after her husband, Ralph, had died. And, yeah, I found those things very helpful for me. It would have, It would be... <sighs> It would be lovely to be able to, it would, it's the greatest thing to being able to have access to sit and have a conversation with them. I mean, everybody has, has heard that question once or twice before. If, you know, anybody you could have dinner with alive or dead, who would it be? Well, these women have left a way for you to have a conversation Indeed. with them yeah. because they wrote down their thoughts and their feelings and surprise, surprise. They're probably just like the ones that you have. Do you know, I love that as an idea. When, when you were saying that, I had a sudden vision of a few friends getting around, having supper together and fishing out a copy of the book and look, just looking at little bits together. A kind of diary. What a lovely mm. I I think I challenge everybody to do that. As a matter of fact, oh, please, I will do that on my own. And post to send me the pictures. Yeah. I absolutely will. So those of you that are local and friends of mine, you just wait. I'm gonna, you'll, you're going to get a dinner, a dinner invitation, and we're going to meet one of these historical women mm -hmm. and and get to know them. And maybe 
they'll have insight into our own lives. And what amazing thing that would be. And just a lightener for the pudding course, I can even point you towards some extracts about food. So, Oh, yes. <laughs> well, as long as we're talking about extracts of, of mm. things in the book, let's talk about something a little bit juicier. Mm -hmm. What do they talk about when they talk about sex? Because I oh. know they probably do, because where else are they going to talk about it? Sure. Um, obviously, the talk gets more explicit as you move into the 20th rather than earlier centuries. But all the same, Queen Victoria, you don't expect to find her before her wedding, I think it was, uh, talking about how wonderful Albert looked in skin-tight breeches with nothing underneath them. Or, indeed, the morning after, after their wedding night, how Albert put my stockings on for me and I watched him shave a great delight. And you know, again, it's not what we think of as Queen Victoria, is it? The, the right. Of no. But moving, moving on, you've got someone like the French um, a courtesan's a, a slightly harsh way of putting it. The French dancer beauty Leanne de Pougy writing about you know lying in bed all afternoon um, with her her husband sitting reading poetry while she and the Duchess and another beautiful woman cavorted on the bed. But the real one cavorted her word, I may say. The real one <laughs> um, is. A woman, or as she was then a very young woman, um, end of her teens, early 20s, called Joan Wyndham, who was writing, began writing her diaries, which have since been published, in the Second World War. And she writes about everything about whether or not to lose her virginity, about how um, at first, you know, when someone grabbed her and kissed her, it was really rather vile, blubbery lips and a hairy chin, but she made up her mind to endure, you know, to put up with it and see see if it, if, if, if it got any, any more fun, uh, which I'm happy to say it did. She wrote about her first orgasm, about experience of assorted sexual positions and experiments, because she was moving in quite bohemian circles, um, even at one that may be slightly too shocking to repeat here uh, about, well, about masturbation, but I won't go into details. Um, no, her frankness is just staggering. Perhaps that was the Second World War in a way, because there was that feeling that a lot of these young men were go you know were were fighting were going to the front and all were refugees and so they'd been close to they all felt close to death i mean joan was writing about the raids and so on which she experienced so therefore the old rules didn't matter quite so much but i joan windham's diaries a staggering reading wow i'm i'm just thinking on how shocking that would be in World War Two, so this is mm. is no. yeah. the nineteen forties. Yeah, that is. I mean, that is that is a. Those are stunning statements and stunning thoughts. Mm. But you're absolutely right. There were so many extremes yes. happening during World War Two yeah. that you know the the gloves came off. Yes, the 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 uh, the masks that we put on our faces. Mm. You know the the tape we put across our mouths mm. to muffle ourselves no longer matter. Yeah, I think that was exactly it. Yes. I'm really looking forward to meeting these women. I mean, these are these are women that through other no other means could I ever possibly get to know them, but through these thoughts and writings I can. So I'm again going to challenge everybody to have a dinner party, invite all your best girlfriends over and write and read an excerpt out of the this book yeah. about secret voices and discuss it. Find out yeah. what more that you can learn from them, what more you have in common Maybe with them. Each, Ooh, that would be even more fascinating. Yeah. I'm sorry, say it again, Sarah. You cut out. 
I said, maybe each of your guests could take a diarist and look at them. See who most oh, that would be so, mm. so amazing. It's so like, amazing. It's like a kind of reading, actually. It's like a kind of book club idea, isn't it? Ooh, it is. Think about that. Hmm. Hmm. Quite. Hmm. There might be a there. There might be something there, Sarah. Hmm. Maybe we can do this on two different continents. Hmm. Mm, definitely. Well, see what happens when that when way. women get together. Exactly. Exactly. Something good does. So I I could speak to you all day about this because these women are fascinating. And first, before I get ahead of myself, I want to say thank you for doing this work. Ooh. If I didn't think thank you before, I want to thank you now. Thank this you. work is important. Thank you. Know, you. And as we, as we've learned over the last several years, our his a lot of our history has been muffled for a long time, and the things that we have that we thought we knew mm. weren't mm. they weren't completely correct. Yeah. So, the, yeah. so this is giving us an opportunity and a window to relearn what we thought we already knew, but now we get the we get the full story mm. rather than the p- mm. small pieces that we have been educated on. Mm. So, yeah. I so think, thank you for doing this work. Thank you. Thank you for appreciating it. No, I do believe that women's lives in the past were both more nuanced and more adventurous than we often think. I think we often tend to look back and kind of see them as, you know, good girls, bad girls, victims, whores. That's the way that traditional and, to be frank, male-dominated history always used to look at them. But this shows a much, much more complex picture and one we can absolutely recognize in ourselves. I'm so excited to learn about these women. I'm just can't wait. So again, I'm getting ahead of myself because the thought, Sarah, you and I talk can talk forever and I never get bored because there's the more you speak, the more fascinated I am on your work and these women. Um, I don't want to neglect to tell everybody when your book is out. Right. It's just come out now in the States as well as in England. So it is now available. I'm tempted to use the the usual phrase, in all good bookshops, do ask yours if <laughs> they haven't got it, or, of course, on Amazon. Please, everybody, go and, and look up this book. It is fascinating, and I want to make sure that I give everybody the title, and I don't want to screw it up because sometimes I do that. The title of her new book is Secret Voices, A Year of Women's Diaries. These are women's innermost intimate thoughts. And you thought that you were alone. You are not. These women have been dealing with the same issues for centuries. So please go look up this book. Sarah, this is my favorite part of the whole show. I know that in, in those that have been listening for a while know what I'm going to ask, but you may not know. So here's the opportunity. I want you to have an intimate discussion, an intimate lasting thought directly with the audience without me interrupting. So I'm going to step away from the mic for a moment and give you an open opportunity to speak directly to them. Goodness. So the mic is yours. Goodness. I guess if there is one lesson from the women's diaries, from these women over for centuries, it's dare to dare. It's don't feel you have to wait for for permission, effectively, from society, from anybody else, to do what you want to do, to be yourself. Don't do what so many of us who are now older, who were educated in an older tradition, do, and always look for rules you feel you must follow because the good stuff happens when you break them. I love that. Good stuff happens when you break them. So we all need to go be rule breakers. (laughs) Sarah, thank you again for being here. 
if the audience wants to reach you besides looking at your books? And this book, Secret Voices, is not the only book that you've written. You've written several other books. Yes. So please go pursue Mm -hmm. her. Where else can they find you if they want to reach out to you directly? Oh, I have a website, uh, sarahgristwood.com. Twitter, I'm at Sarah Gristwood. Instagram, I'm Sarah Gristwood. It's always my name, basically. But I'm there on social media, and I do have a website. I will make sure that all of those links, I'll make sure all the links are in the show notes, so you can. I'll make it easy for everybody so they can go out and connect with you directly. Please go look at her books, The Secret Voices. I'm so excited to read this. Like I said, she has several other books a lot of them focusing on the women mm-hmm. from the from the royal Victorian eras eras. Please go look those up. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely amazing stuff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, so much for being here. And I want to thank all of you. And I'll see you again next time. This is just the beginning. that's our show. I am so grateful for each and every one of you and your unwavering support and your continued belief in this movement that has become much bigger than me, much bigger than just a podcast. It has become this forward momentum that we are all doing together. If you are ready or you know somebody that is, that is ready to tell your story and share your value with the world, please connect with me. You can reach me at audra at womeninthearena.net. I am so honored and thankful that you will share your story with me and I'll make sure that it is well taken care of. I will never stop thanking each and every one of you and I cannot wait to talk to you again next week as we share another woman's story and we celebrate her doing extraordinary things in plain sight. We'll see you next time.